The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Jason Hart. This morning I'd like to begin with a question as we have done for the last several weeks on our emphasis on heaven and hell. And this morning, the question is one that I think should be very important to every single one of you. I want you to think very seriously this morning, perhaps even take out an index card in front of you. Maybe you can jot this down on your iPad or on your iPhone. And and just for the sake of concealing any embarrassment, perhaps you might want to kind of hover over and sort of write this down yourself. If anything, just sort of paint the picture in your mind, get a thought in your mind. Can you think of any sin of your own that you wish would just go away? That you could send off to someplace else and it would stay away forever? In Denmark, there is a celebration every year in June the 21st through the 24th called St. Hans Eve. And it's in that celebration that people of villages will come together and they will take some of the relics or items that would represent the burdens and the problems of their life for the past year, and they would bring this together into a heap and create a large pile. And then on top of this pile, they would put a straw witch. At the climax of the celebration, they would light the witch on fire and watch the entire pile of rubble go up in flames. And what this was to symbolize was to send all of their burdens and all of their troubles and all of their crutches and, and all of their problems and just send them away and dump them on Germany. Now that would be pretty nice, wouldn't it? Just to be able to take any sin of ours and just send it away. Something that we have struggled with, something that continues to impact our souls even after receiving forgiveness from God we just keep coming back to that sin we keep going to it over and over and over again how nice would that be now that's one question but here's another question can you think of any sin of your own that you would want to be upon somebody else To wish that it would go away would be one thing, but to wish for it to be loaded upon the shoulders of another individual is a completely different thing. Because those of us who truly believe that God's Word is right and that His promises are true, we know how God looks upon the sin. We know that God must punish sin. And so from our perspective... We wouldn't want to wish our sin upon anybody. I wouldn't want my sin to be upon your life. You've got enough problems of your own with the sins that you have. You don't need mine. Can you think of anybody that you would want to be loaded with your sins if those sins could be completely removed from you? Quite a sober, isn't it? Because we realize that our sins are our sins. They're our responsibility. They're our offense against a holy and righteous God. I want to turn your attention over to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16 is the chapter in Leviticus which I guess you could say is the centerpiece of Leviticus. It's the Day of Atonement. Now there are a lot of proceedings and a lot of things that take place on the, the uh, Day of Atonement and we won't be able to look at all of the details this morning because of time. Aaron on behalf of the people had to offer up a bull as an offering for his sins before he could ever do anything. It was on that day that two goats were chosen from among the people. 
And these two goats were placed at the door of the tabernacle. And whenever these goats were placed before the door of the tabernacle, lots were cast for them. One of the lots would fall upon a goat that would be given for the Lord. One of the lots would fall upon a goat that was called, according to the text, for Azazel. The goat that was chosen for the Lord. This was God's choice for God. This was the goat that would be slain. This was the goat that must die. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This goat, it must die. And the purpose of this goat was to make an appeasement for God. That's the meaning of the word atonement. It is a cover. It is a propitiation. It is to appease a holy God who has been sinned against. And as that goat was being slain, the blood of that was taken into the tabernacle, into the holy place, into the holiest of holies, and it was sprinkled seven times for, for the atonement of the people because they had sinned in a great way against a mighty God. God's sanctuary must be atoned. It should tell us a little something about the seriousness of sin. Just by the very fact that the tabernacle was among people, defiled it. And so before God could ever do anything about His people, even His sanctuary needed to be holy. But what is interesting about this goat? is that there was a great deal of anxiety that surrounded it. Now, the people of Israel always looked forward to the Day of Atonement. This was the day that their sins were rolled forward for another year. This is the day that their sins would be taken away. But all of that, that possibility, that Hope, that recognition was only possible if God was accepting of that goat. Think about the anxiety of the people. They were helpless. They couldn't do anything. Everything about their sins was riding on what happened with this goat. Aaron had, had to have on the right clothes. He had, the right, had to have the right attitude. Then he had to go through all the right and appropriate steps. He had this command and that command. And, and every little iota had to be served in order for that to be accepting to God. And even then, even though Aaron was a high priest, he was still a human being. This had to be acceptable by the grace of God. So many times we look back into the Old Testament and we say, well, it's works, 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 works. The grace of God is present here. Because it was only by the grace of God that this sacrifice could be acceptable. And then there was the other goat. The one in the text, in some of your translations, called Azazel. The other translations, like the King James, says the scapegoat. Quite simply, it was the go-away goat. Ever had somebody in your life, and, and they just keep bugging you and bugging you and bugging you, and you, you just you get anxious, you get all wrapped up in knots, just, just go away! I can't stand to look at you, right? This was the go-away goat. This was God's choice goat for man. See, because even though appeasement was made by this goat, the sins were still there. The sins needed to be taken away. So this goat must live. So Aaron 
took his hands and placed it upon the head of this goat and he began to confess all of the sins of the people. I can't help but imagine Aaron standing over the, this goat and just naming them one by one by one by one. And the people even listening to the sound of his voice call out this man's sin and that woman's sin and this man's sin and this other person's sin and the sins of the nation and the sins of their fathers and all of the sins. And no telling how long he spent hovering over this goat confessing the sins of the people. And then they would take that goat and someone was appointed to lead that goat off into the wilderness. So far out in the wilderness to a place where it was not inhabited by anything and leave that goat there alive with the impossibility of ever returning again. Now with this goat, there was great anxiety. Imagine the relief with the people when Aaron came back out and began confessing their sins. Now they had confidence. We have glorified God. We have honored God. He is appeased. He's satisfied with us. And then imagine the incredible release. Imagine the burden that was lifted as that goat began to wander off into the wilderness, never to return again. What an incredible celebration this was for the souls of men. But it was only temporary. It was only temporary. It wasn't a permanent solution. And every single year it served as a reminder of the darkest truth. Look at the people. See their anxiety. See them in the scene of the Day of Atonement. And what could they do? Nothing. The only thing that they could do to contribute to their atonement was their sin. And friends, the darkest truth is that the only thing that any man or woman can do to contribute to our salvation is our sin. An offended God must be satisfied. Sin must be removed. God must be satisfied. And sin must be removed. God must be satisfied and sin must be removed. Nobody can do that. No mere man is able to accomplish that. And so we must rely upon a substitute. Something that is greater than a man. Something that is perfect, something that is pure, something that is awesome, something that is incredible, something that is beyond anything that you or I could ever become. Because without the substitute, God is never appeased. Without the substitute, sin is never removed. And the only substitute by which men must be saved is none other than our Savior Jesus Christ. He was the one for the Lord, chosen by God for God. And it is He that must die. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Jesus even told His disciples, I must go into Jerusalem and suffer at the hands of men. Even though they were saying, be it far from you, Lord, forbid you. We don't want you to go. Jesus said, I must die. 
I've been chosen by the Lord. I am the Lord for this very reason. I must die. I must shed my blood. Well, because without my blood, God cannot be appeased. He cannot be satisfied. The Bible tells us that Jesus was the propitiation for our sins. You know what the word propitiation means? To satisfy. To appease a God of holy wrath, of righteous indignation against sin. To appease Him. To appease Him so that His grace may be effective, necessary. Imagine the anxiety that we have over this offense. We are able even to get a glimpse of the picture of that anxiety as Jesus falls down upon His knees in the Garden of Gethsemane just a few hours before He is hanging upon the cross. He's filled with such anxiety that he begins to sweat as if it were great drops of blood. And what was the prayer that he was offering to God? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This must be an appeasement. And all of creation is depending on this goat to be perfect and to be acceptable unto God. Jesus must be an acceptable sacrifice or God will never be pleased so that He could be the runaway goat. It was God's choice for man. Our sorrows, our griefs, our sins, our iniquities must be borne by Him, but He must be living. He must be cut off from the camp. He must be cast away. Friends, Jesus could have died any way possible. There were several times that Jesus was about to be killed. People were about to stone Him. They were about to throw Him off of a cliff. There was one time that the people were rushing so greatly upon Jesus because of His teachings and because of the things that He did that He even told His disciples, we must get back lest the people kill us. Jesus could have died anyway. But He must be cast outside the camp. He must be sent away outside of the holy city of Jerusalem. He must be caught and cast out away from the living. And that's where we find Jesus on the cross, Golgotha. A place set outside of the city. Because it was not right, it was not holy, it was not in God's will for man to be a curse in the city. And what a relief from the offense this goat was as the sins of all mankind your sins and mine were laid upon the go-away goat. What man could not do for himself, God did for him. The Son of God became a Son of Man so that the sons of men could become a Son of God atoned and the sins forgiven. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For our sake He made Him 
to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. So in the sixth hour, 12 o'clock, when darkness came upon the land, Jesus had become sin. He had become adultery. He had become abomination. He had become blasphemy. He had become fornication, idolatry, immorality, impurity. He had become hypocrisy and gossiping, gambling and drunkenness. He had become lies. He had become deception. He had become cheating. He had become murder. He had become covetousness, lasciviousness, lust. Jesus became sin. He became you. And He became me. If God who is purer than eyes could not look upon sin, neither should anybody else. God clothed over the nation, over the cross, complete and utter darkness. And Jesus, as the goat for the Lord and as the go-away goat, bore the sins of the world and He was utterly and completely alone. And in His banishment, in His exile, there's no wonder we hear the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus was doing for you and for me what I could not do myself. In heaven's darkest hour, had become mine, and it had become your brightest hope. But that hope is only possible if you'll come to the one who makes it possible. And you can do that while we stand and sing. This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart.